Now, before you were a goth kid in Seattle, <laughs> you were uh, you went back for a little while and lived in Colombia, where you're uh, catching tarantulas and you're uh, getting having lizards as pets. Wow, how do you know this? Yes, I did. <laughs> I did. I was uh, sent off to Colombia with my then sister, um, and I spent about a year there with family members and was just a little nature child with my cousin. And yeah, we just explored and it was incredible. My nickname was Gringo. And <laughs> it was so beautiful there. I would love to go back. I haven't been back since. Now, as a, a goth teen, uh, did you feel the need to come out or were you already like, I'm everything, shut up? <laughs> no, it was still, you know, listen, it was the 80s. So nobody was out. And I mm -hmm. think that's something that a lot of the younger kids today don't realize, the visibility that exists right now. It was very different, not that long ago. There was absolutely no one out of the closet in my high school days. I was the only person I knew in my senior year out of all the schools, and I moved around a lot, that was out as bisexual as, in a, as a senior, which was kind of a big deal at the time and was pretty ballsy. But luckily, that school was a very nice school. Like, it is funny when you go to a lot of different schools, they really do behave differently. Like there are schools where being a total snob and being rude, you know, behooves you. The popular kids were like the bitches, like mean girls. But there are other schools where actually being kind and lovely to one another is respected. And my senior year happened to be that kind of a school, Federal Way High. They were really nice people, all the popular kids. So I was treated really well, even as a little weirdo by goth kid, I was treated really well. And how did your family react to your coming out? You know, I've, it's, till this day, and I think if you're Latino, you would, you'll relate to this, my father and I have never discussed it. Mm. It is just, the word gay just hasn't come out of his mouth. So I know he knows, he knows I know he knows. It's one of those things. And at this point, I'm a grown man, I've forgiven him. Part of growing up is forgiving your parents, you know, and it's more for yourself than it is for them. He doesn't understand. Uh, you know, he comes from a different time. And particularly in the Latino or the POC community, there are these machismo you know, uh, behaviors that take over. So I know how uncomfortable it was for him. And uh, I respect that. And you know, some people are like, you should talk to him, it's time. But, but I think to myself, eh, why put him through this at this point? He's such a good man. And he treats me with such great respect when we talk now. He tells me he loves me. He tells me he's proud of me. I know what that means. Mm -hmm. he just, I just don't need to have that conversation with him. And that's okay. I don't need it, and I don't think it, he really needs it at this point. And you haven't accidentally put him on your mailing list for oh, your parties <laughs> with all your flyers for Wiener, Hot Dog, Brutus, Wiener. Cox a lot, and everything else. Oh, you know, I do suspect he's probably on social media, and I can't imagine he hasn't right. perused my my page and has probably had his eyes opened a little bit. But uh, sorry, Dad. God bless. <laughs> uh, now you did start throwing parties in high school. I did. Yeah. What was your first party? It was actually called Mario's Beer Bath. Wow. And I drew the <laughs> flyer myself. I was in a bathtub with like Jason Priestley or something. <laughs> Fantastic. And, <laughs> and bubbles. And um, I just remember thinking uh, I could do better than what's out there. You know, like I, I was into the nightlife and I thought to myself, you know, there's got, I have ideas that could be more interesting. I'm not, I wasn't really that inspired. So um, that's what motivated me to do a part. I was still in high school. And so I just pulled out all the stops and all these kooky ideas. I had body painted go-go dancers and little peachy puff girls. Remember the little cigarette girls? Uh -huh. But they had candy grams, which was you could give, send a little note, a little anonymous note to somebody you thought was cute. So it had them right like, you got a great ass. And then anonymously give a little piece of candy to someone. And I had a drag queen fortune teller with a crystal ball talking shit <laughs> to people in the corner. And I had all my friends perform just pop-up performances, you know. It was just an opportunity to just have fun and be playful. And uh, I just remember that night leaving with a huge wad of cash. Mm. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> I can do this. This could be a job. Because that sounds like a template for the parties that you're still throwing now. It is. It was. <laughs> Nothing has changed. It was bit by the bug, and I've been uh, an event producer ever since. It was, uh, it's been an amazing ride. I'm so 
lucky. I mean, you know, you've, you've done it yourself. Oh, so yes. It, yeah. It's just, uh, it, it really is a blessing to be able to, and I'm proud of it. I think it's a humble, it's a wonderful career. What we're doing is we're bringing people together. It's connection. And I can't tell you how many times I hear from people like, oh, I met my husband at your club, or, you know, I met my, me and my best friends met at Hot Dog, or whatever the story is. You know, I can feel good about that. And sometimes I'm sitting in that DJ booth at the end of the night having a kiki with my DJs, and looking out at a crowd of sweaty, smiling, tipsy people that are making out, having fun and giggling, and just know like, I'm part of this. I'm bringing people together. It is a wonderful, I mean, that's what life is about, right? Yeah. Connection. It really is the most important thing. So you're, you throw your black dyed hair, long hair and <laughs> eyeliner to the side. It's getting you long hit. again. I no, yes it is. <laughs> And you throw yourself into New York City. Is that your yeah. first stop after high yeah. school? Yeah. I always knew I'd end up in New York. I think that when you're young and queer, particularly, there's a certain breed of people that, that just know they want to be in the city. And New York is the city. New York City, the greatest city in the world. And I remember reading the old, um, what was it, interview magazines mm -hmm. when they were in black and white. And they were kind of more like zines. They had really interesting sort of subversive storytelling and they I just remember reading about like the leather scene in the 70s and it was all very underground and the art scene and all of it just looked so great I just remember just you know being a kid in my room and reading these things and thinking like I, I have to go to the city I have to be in the city and uh, I started throwing rave parties in in Seattle and then I met uh, superstar DJ Kiyoki uh -huh. <laughs> and he is the one that invited me to move to New York so it was a perfect opportunity Wow. Great timing. Went and lived in New York, and uh, that was it. Tell me about, um, now that's the late 80s, early yeah. 90s. Oh, 90s. I was in New York in the 90s. 90s. So uh, give us a slice of our, you know, early 90s New York City oh nightlife, because it is very different. I mean, yes. that's even different than when I moved there in the late 90s. I think it was even more raw and incredible right. at that period. So give us a taste of what a night going out was like when you first oh, moved there. Oh, I mean, there. listen, 90s New York City was a moment, and I'm so glad that I was a part of that, because... It, we, we sort of had a bit of a renaissance. I mean, even when I when I moved there, I remember thinking, "Wait a minute, where's where's the back room? Where's the these?" Like a lot of it had dissipated. Giuliani was already there. We all know mm. now who he really is. <laughs> right. But in New York at the time, a lot of people thought, "Oh, he's you know taking care of New York City." But he was implementing this quality of life campaign, right? You remember? Uh -huh. And it, I all I knew is it wasn't my life, and it wasn't the quality that I was looking for. He was. Just like in the, you know, in our history, the 20s, the 40s, the 50s, he, they, he, they were targeting uh, queer businesses, particularly the queer venues and people of color and that kind of thing. So I, that's what sort of motivated me to start the cock and open the cock was kind of a, a political indirect response to Giuliani and his quality of life campaign like let's just just be as wild and nasty as we can in your face as loud as possible and we kicked ass and it was pre-cell phones so back then in new york people would do the wildest things you remember it was uh because the only people that you know the people that were there we would dress up we would show off we would do you know have all sorts of wild experiences but we knew that it was just for each other and for ourselves, we weren't doing it for Instagram or for to make a million dollars. It was really just like, let's just have a great time expressing ourselves with each other. So I'm glad I got to be a part of that sort of pre-cell phone, pre disnification of, of New York City. But yeah, the gentrification of New York was already happening at the time. So what we did was like, hey, let's, let's not let it take over. So we had to kind of be a little bit louder, and we were. And it was so much fun. And I think of Rock and Roll Fag Bar and Jackie 60 and, you know, so many wonderful squeeze box, these clubs that inspired me uh, and are part of what I do now. So there was still so much happening there. And there still is, you know, it's just different. Now, tell me the origin story of the cock. How did that 
come about? How did you get involved? What was the first night? And then because by the time I got there, it was Mario Diaz seven nights a week, yeah. all the drag yeah. stars, <laughs> ping, ball shoot, ping, ping pong balls shooting out of places, right, contests. Right. I mean, it was legendary. What is the origin story of that? Well, the East Village, the renaissance of the East Village is what I'll call it. Uh, Happened. I think it started at a place called Cake. I don't know. I think it was before your time. No, that was still at the very end when yeah, I got there. Yeah, yeah. But um, myself, Mistress for Micah, and David Morrow decided to, you know, throw a party there. Um, it was uh, called Hustler, and that was kind of the beginning of it. And I just remember going to the boiler room and to all the different bars all over the village. And we were back then. It was flyers and posters, and that's kind of how we did it. You literally had to go out and hand people a piece of paper. Right. You know, it was a very different animal. <laughs> yeah. So we were just doing that, and it was gangbusters. I mean, it was packed. And I think one of the things was we brought back the back room. We had a back room there, and there mm -hmm. were no back rooms at the time, which have a very important historical, you know, presence in our in our queer history. Uh, and also they're fun, so <laughs> <laughs> so it was great because it was you know it was sleazy and wild, but it was also amazing and creative. I moved there around the same time of uh, Justin Vivian Bond, and was lucky enough to have them hostess for me. And uh, what a brilliant person to work with, and we worked together for years. So uh, it was it was the kind of experience where you could be nasty and kinky and yet it had a, it was always had a sense of humor was always tongue in cheek so you never really felt dirty and it was i think the core of my work in general till this day has to help dissipate the shame that we carry around with us around our sexuality and i know it's a different world now but there's still a need for it and um but at the time it was much more of a political statement to you know be a part of that kind of environment but yeah, I mean, Foxy was what did it. I started throwing this party called Foxy. Uh -huh. <laughs> probably my greatest party ever. <laughs> and it, the, the idea was everybody that came in would get play money that we called Foxy dollars. So whoever had the most Foxy dollars at the end of the night would win like title of Foxy is Person Alive or something silly. It really wasn't about that, the title, it was just about the experience, right? Getting wild. So however people would make these Foxy dollars, they would do whatever they needed to do. And I just, I mean, for years, I remember, you know, being drunk as a dog, just counting these Foxy dollars the other night. But it was Jackie Beat and Justin Bond and World Famous Bob and Dean Johnson and Penelope Tuesday. Cookie, I had amazing hosts. Uh, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, those are all nightlife legends. Right. I mean, all in one place, all in this Tiny, yes. low ceiling bar. Yes. When I opened the cock, I created the whole idea. I designed the rooster neon. With, I had my friend Scott Ewalt lay that out for me. And we didn't want to put the word the cock on it. I just thought, let's just put the neon out there. And I had my friends come over one day. And this was li a little bar in the East Village that had like drywall up. There was no one there. But I knew the owner, and I kept getting kicked out of all the venues that I was throwing Foxy at. Mm -hmm. So I'd have like three days to find a venue to do Foxy. And then I'd move it to another bar, and it would be packed. I don't know how I did it, but <laughs> it worked. People loved Foxy, and they would find it. It was really a word of mouth moment. So um, once again, we got kicked out of another place called Velvet. And I had, like again, three days. And I, I remember this little bar in the East Village, 12th and A. I don't even think it had a name. Maybe it did, but. Um, and I knew that the owner uh, had this really sort of scandalous, like kind of drug, druggy, like bar in the East Village. It wasn't gay, he's a straight guy. And he was also like, you know, kind of a shady character. I knew he had a lot of stuff going on, like a slumlord and all these things. Uh -huh. I thought he's perfect. <laughs> he's like perfect partner for me, excuse me. Because I thought this is a guy that's willing to take chances. So. Um, I was like, hey, can I throw a party at your at your bar? And he's like, oh, yeah, sure, whatever. And I did, and he was blown away by mm -hmm. He's like, come back next week. So we did it there for a few weeks. And the next thing you know, we're shaking hands on a partnership. Mm -hmm. So I just went in. I changed the name. I had my friends come in, and we painted the walls and blue glitter everywhere. And I made lightning bolts and hearts. And, and uh, I, I staffed the entire staff and uh, promoted seven nights a week, I think, uh, Jojo Americo and Scott Ewalt had like a Thursday night rock and roll thing, and 
Candice and Lena and Bunny uh, were doing the Friday night thing with the girls, the showgirls. And I did Foxy on Saturdays. And yeah, so I had a whole week's worth um, of, you know, entertainment. And from day one, it was slammed. It was, it was wall to wall from the day I started it till the day I left. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you gracefully came in like the, like a designer comes into an old <laughs> uh, fancy house and creative directs around. I mean, you creative directed that, and it became so influential just still to, to this day. Right. I right. mean, uh, I think the three of us here, the cock, is still our favorite place to go in New York City and is like the... The epitome of a fun downtown, good old faggoty right. fashion fun right, time. Right, right. I'm very proud of it. It was the best time of my life, and yeah, it was good. But you know, like everything in life, you have to continue moving forward, and you never want to feel stuck. And mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, listen, life is about change, and change is going to happen to you. It's, it's happening to all of us right now. And sometimes you just know inside of yourself that you need to create the change, and that's what happened. I was, I just knew that. Time was up for me there, and I needed to make a move. And you know, Jackie Beat had moved to LA, and I kind of, I think in the back of my head, I knew as a actor that I wanted to be in LA at some point. Plus, I loved the sun. So um, then 9/11 happened, made it hard to leave after 9/11, mm -hmm. because when you're a New Yorker, and I think if you live a couple years in New York, you become a New Yorker innately, because it's a tough city. Um, but 9/11 was so it really brought us together, and it was so hard to leave that because it was such a bonding experience for everyone in the city at the time. But, um, but I still did it, so I came to LA. I just thought I wanted to move to LA, you know, be with my friends and be in the sun, get on TV, get a house, all that shit. Hello, children! 